All right, it is two o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Looks like there are a couple more people that are joining us. <clears throat> Let me see. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Davis, and I'll be coordinating things on the back end of the event. If you have any questions during the event, please feel free to place them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will have a portion during the end of the presentation where we'll um, go over those questions. And also, um, yeah, if there's anything that you need, just let me know, pop it down in the box and I'll be monitoring that during the presentation. I will also post the link for our evaluation in the Q&A box towards the end of the presentation. So for those of you that are new to the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, welcome. We're a center here in Ann Arbor in a collaboration between University of Michigan, Wayne State and Michigan State University. We offer a variety of dementia related research studies so if you're interested in learning more about our wellness programs for caregivers, Lewy Body Dementia Support Groups, or if you want to get involved with research, then feel free to visit our website, our social media, or reach out to me, and I can point you in the right direction. So this event is being recorded, and it will be available later on our YouTube um, page. So feel free to share this with anybody that missed it, or go back and review it if you like to yourself. We will have an event evaluation. Again, I'll place that link in the Q&A box at the end of the presentation, and you'll also receive an email with that link. We do appreciate and value your feedback, so um, it's much appreciated if you could fill that out for us. So now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Bukowski is a research assistant professor at the University of Michigan. She's an environmental and genetic epidemiologist with expertise in epigenetic and epidemiology. She is interested in applying these tools to understand the combined genetic and environmental um, excuse me, etiology of neurological disorders throughout the life course. She has worked on mental health issues such as autism spectrum disorder, substance abuse, and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Bukowski has experience with heavy metal exposure assessment, particularly biomarkers of cumulative lead exposure. In addition, she studies the interaction between multiple pollutant exposures and genetics in aging populations, one, the risk of cognitive decline. So now if you could please join me in welcoming Dr. Kelly Bukowski. Thank you for that warm welcome, Danielle. Appreciate it. And thank you to the Michigan Alzheimer's Disease Research Center for inviting me to speak with you all today. As Danielle said, my name is Kelly Bukulski. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Michigan, and I'm honored to speak with you all today. Today, I'll talk about environmental chemicals that we are all exposed to in our daily lives and what that has to do with our risk of dementia. We'll start by talking about epidemiologic or population-based evidence measured in humans, and then we'll drill down to some of the molecular mechanisms and toxicology studies that support these uh, associations. So please feel free to ask me questions at any time. Um, I'm looking forward to interacting with you all. Dementia is a neurodegenerative disorder characterized by loss of cognitive abilities that impairs our ability to carry out activities of daily living. The most prevalent form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease, and dementia types also include vascular dementia, frontotemporal lobe dementia, and Lewy body disease. Currently, the burden of Alzheimer's disease in our society is quite high. Many millions of people and their caregiving families struggle with dementia, and the prevalence is expected to increase in the coming years. The greatest known risk factor for dementia is increasing age, and today we'll talk about some of the other risk factors for dementia. I'm an epidemiologist, so one of the first uh, steps I do when I'm studying a new disorder is I try to think about the heritability of the disorder. So I try to think about what proportion of the risk for that disease comes from, um, broadly speaking, your genetic bucket, and what proportion comes, broadly speaking, uh, from your environment bucket. And we do these kinds of studies without even having to measure people's genetics or environment. We do it by looking at relatives and how often um, does the disease co-occur among members of a family. So for example, um, these wonderful Brazilian um, 
Twins, identical twins who celebrated their 100th birthday. This would be the type of relationship we would look for and how often does Alzheimer's disease or dementia co-occur among members of a family with known relatedness status. And we can use this to estimate what is the approximate heritability of a disorder. So for example, here's a plot where we have that heritability ranging from zero to not heritable to 100% fully heritable on the y-axis. We have the prevalence or how common is the disorder on the x-axis. And we see that Alzheimer's disease is kind of right in the middle of several other um, uh, chronic disorders. So that means that there's a portion of the risk for Alzheimer's disease, which is likely coming from genetic sources, and a portion of the risk which is likely coming from environmental sources. Um, and there's also probably some interaction happening between those two spheres. Um, so this is a really... Uh, a uh, strong candidate for someone like me to study where I'm interested in both genetic and environmental risk factors for disease. And I'll show you in this first example what I'm talking about. So one of the most well-studied environmental exposures with uh, dementia is air pollution. Um, air pollution is produced from a variety of sources, including um, combustion byproducts, um, industrial uh, pollution, here, uh, we're looking at exposure to the air pollutant nitrogen dioxide. Um, this was a longitudinal study in, um, in northern Sweden, where they looked at a follow-up of 15 years, and they saw that people who had the lowest level of nitrogen dioxide exposure um, had the lowest hazard of developing dementia over that 15-year period. As you looked at the next quartile or next 25th percentile of um, air pollution exposure, they had slightly higher hazard of developing dementia. And then when we look at the two highest um, quartiles, uh, these folks had much higher hazard of dementia, developing dementia over that period. So we see almost like a dose response effect happening across these um, increasing amount of air pollution exposure. This is what we call a population-based epidemiologic association study. Um, this study was complemented by also some post-mortem um, tissue investigation, this study taking place in uh, Mexico City, uh, where they looked at folks who had exposure to low levels of air pollution uh, compared to folks with high levels of air pollution exposure. And they observed that um, folks with high levels of air pollution exposure had higher levels of um, beta amyloid, which is a characteristic protein of Alzheimer's type dementia, um, in both the frontal cortex brain region and the hippocampus brain region, which are key places for learning and memory. For example, here is a um, image of, of a histologic image of brain tissue from a woman um, in this study. This was a 38-year-old woman with 15 years of education, passed away from a car accident in Mexico City. And we can see that uh, with her elevated levels of air pollution exposure, she also had um, characteristic beta amyloid plaque deposition here. So we're seeing evidence um, both association level on a population study as well as in some tissue association um, that might support this association. Here's a study that just came out last week. You might've seen it in some of uh, some media reports. Um, this is looking at a different component of air pollution called particulate matter. This is looking at those particles that we can um, observe uh, from air pollution. And they observed that folks who were exposed to higher levels of particulate matter um, over a 28 day window had lower cognitive scores measured by the mini mental status exam. Um, they also observed that folks who were taking um, a non-prescription drug, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, uh, were, had less decrease in their cognition related to air pollution. So here is that same plot, but now it's been painted by whether you took one of these non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, the people who did not take them are in blue. They have a lower decrease in cognition with air pollution exposure. And the people who did take um, that drug were, are in red and they have less decrease due to air pollution. So this is suggesting um, potentially there's ways to um, mitigate uh, the relationship between uh, environmental exposures and dementia through, through types of interventions. And this was even highlighted on the New York Times this week. Um, so these are um, an emerging area of a lot of interest and focus in terms of thinking about Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and really strongly how can we prevent or um, protect people's health. Environmental exposures are um, a broad uh, field. 
We can think of um, environmental exposures, including factors such as physical exposures like radiation, psychosocial factors such as stress, um, lifestyle and behavioral factors, um, infectious or biologic factors, uh, pharmaceutical drugs can be exposures, um, dietary factors, as well as these environmental pollution um, exposure factors that I'm thinking about today. Um, and there's a term we use in the field to encompass this broad idea of environmental exposures as the exposome. This would be the combined exposure that you might have from all sources, external sources that are reaching your internal environment. And as researchers, we will attempt to assess or measure or approximate someone's exposures by using uh, measures of those exposures in blood or other uh, peripheral tissues. Exposure to environmental uh, chemicals is something that we all experience. Uh, the United States is a uh, leader globally in terms of chemical production here in terms of uh, tons over time, you can see. Um, also in terms of the variety of different environmental chemicals we produce industrially. Uh, uh, at the time of this report, I say here, there were over 85,000 different chemical types in production in the US. Um, at that time, only about 300 had completed rigorous health and safety assessments through the Environmental Protection Agency in the US. Um, and only five had been banned for uh, their harms to health and safety. Um, to help you, you think about what, what do I mean by some of these environmental chemicals, here's just a list of some of these here. So some of these airborne pollutants we were just talking about, um, industrial chemicals and solvents, as well as heavy metals. And these I'll, I'll focus on and talk about first. This is a particular area of interest for me in terms of thinking about metals. This can seem a little daunting, but in general, I am hopeful about this aspect of research. I consider it um, uh, a, a area which is potentially modifiable. So this is a way we can help people. This is a way we can improve our environments and improve our brain health uh, by um, taking action uh, to make sure we are using safe practices um, with respect to production and uh, use of these compounds. Uh, it's specifically thinking about metals. Um, here's a map of the United States uh, that is painted by census track in terms of um, levels of lead which are estimated um, in the blood of people who live there. So what you can notice from here in red colors are higher levels of lead, in the blue colors are lower levels of lead, um, and you see that uh, really these red levels or orange levels are spread all throughout the US. Um, so it's widespread. Um, and it's also variable. There's kind of hot spots in different locations. So this is something for us to worry about um, in terms of helping um, a wide variety of, of people in our community. When I want, when I, one of the first things I'm doing when I'm designing a study of environmental exposures and dementia, I want to think about what time period do I want to measure that chemical in. So we mentioned I could measure uh, environmental exposures in blood or another peripheral tissue. Well, should I measure someone's environmental chemical level at the time at which they come into the clinic and are uh, diagnosed with dementia? Should I measure it a few years earlier when the family might be noting that clinical decline is first becoming clinically apparent? Should I be measuring it even earlier when um, folks believe that clinical and or histopathologic changes might be beginning? Um, so really thinking about what's the window of susceptibility? When do we think these environmental exposures are most important for uh, future dementia? And it may be a lag period of several years prior to the disease onset. There's even folks interested in assessing um, very early life period, which may be relevant um, to setting up your trajectory and your future brain health. So considering the element of timing uh, will be very important in all of our studies, and I'll show you what that looks like going forward. So we interact with chemicals in our environment, either through inhaling them, ingesting them through our food and drink, uh, or dermally absorbing them primarily. These are the three main exposure routes. Um, once a compound comes into our body, it typically circulates around on our superhighway through our bloodstream. Um, and then it will uh, deposit in different tissues in our body, depending on the properties of that tissue and the affinity of the environmental chemical. So the amount of time that a chemical will spend in a tissue depends on the residency, um, depends on the features of that tissue. So for example, um, lead, a chemical I'm particularly interested in, has a similar um, charge and shape as calcium. Uh, that means when lead interacts with your bones, it uh, will replace calcium in the 
hydroxyapatite structure um, and will deposit there, can stay in your bones for up to 40 or 50 years um, versus the amount of time it'll spend in your blood is only on the order of 30 days. Another metal, cal uh, cadmium, is has a strong affinity for your kidneys. It will spend um, about 10 or 15 years in your kidneys um, and maybe only 75 days in your blood. So as an epidemiologist, I can consider myself like a detective. I can try to determine someone's exposure history by comparing levels of their environmental chemicals across different tissues based on the properties of those tissues. Um, and we can use this to try to recreate uh, someone's retrospective environmental uh, exposure chemical history. And I'll talk you through an example of what this looks like. So lead is a chemical which serves no normal physiologic function in our body, um, but we're exposed to it through uh, house paint. If we live in places which were built prior to the 1970s, um, we may be exposed to it through our drinking water, th similarly through uh, aging um, plumbing infrastructure. Um, this was a study where we were working with data from the Veterans Affairs Normative Aging Study out of Boston. Uh, participants at baseline were in their mid 60s, and we capitalized on this idea that lead um, is attracted, that stays in your bones. Um, so we looked at patella bone lead, that's your kneecap, has a half-life of about 10 to 15 years. And we non-invasively using an x-ray instrument, modified x-ray instrument, measured how much lead is present in the participant's kneecap. So this allowed us to almost look back in time to see how much lead was a person exposed to in midlife. Um, and then we followed them up for a period of about 11 and a half years, and we looked to see when did their cognition drop. Um, and we measured cognition using an instrument called the mini mental status exam. And when someone's score dropped below a certain threshold, we considered them cognitively impaired. And what we observed here is that based on participants' patella lead levels, um, so in an in inference of midlife lead level, uh, they had a higher hazard of developing cognitive impairment over this time period. Um, so this is our first kind of inkling that we were seeing that um, exposures in midlife might be relevant to later life dementia. Uh, Dr. Ellen Wells followed up this type of investigation um, by looking more specifically at Alzheimer's disease. So we were looking at cognitive impairment in that last study. Um, and she looked at lead exposure measured in blood, which has a shorter half-life, about 30 days, in participants age 16 above in the um, US National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And she linked the data to mortality files. So seeing if a person passed away due to um, Alzheimer's disease. I think there was about 15 years of follow-up in this study. Um, what she observed was that with higher levels of lead, uh, participants were more likely to have died due to Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it was kind of this dose response association. So in another study with a different, slightly different outcome design, um, there's additional evidence that lead might be associated here with um, these uh, dementia and Alzheimer's disease outcomes. Cadmium is another metal which we are exposed to in our environment, um, which serves no normal physiologic function in our bodies. Uh, we're primarily exposed to cadmium through different routes than lead. Um, for cadmium, we're primarily exposed to our diet through seafood and grains. Um, we're also exposed to cadmium through cigarette smoke, and that's because tobacco uh, plants sequester or pull up cadmium from the soil and they concentrate it. So when folks um, uh, inhale cigarette smoke, um, cadmium is often a part of that combustion byproduct. Uh, this was, again, looking at data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, participants age 16 above. Um, we looked at their blood levels of cadmium, which has a short half-life, so looking at their cadmium levels in, in older adults, um, and we linked it to those uh, public use mortality files. We observed that um, participants' blood cadmium level in later life was associated with a higher hazard of um, dying due to Alzheimer's disease over that follow-up period. We also looked at baseline that their levels of urinary cadmium, which has a really long half-life of about 10 to 15 years. So this stretched into midlife with this, this type of design. And this is because your kidneys have a strong affinity for cadmium. So we have different properties of the tissue. We saw that with um, higher levels of urinary cadmium, there's an even higher hazard of developing Alzheimer's disease over that period. Um, so what we're seeing here is that a timing of exposure likely matters. Um, and here's a second metal that may be associated uh, with dementia or Alzheimer's disease.
we were curious how far back in time we could go. We were um, lacking uh, direct measures of environmental chemicals, but working with a graduate student, um, we were curious about um, uh, asking, working with the Health and Retirement Study, which is a US population-based survey of older adults, who were um, asked via questionnaire to refer to what type of experiences did they have in early life um, before age 16. And then we looked over follow-up to see if they developed um, dementia later on. And what we observed here is that conditions that participants reported experiencing in early life were indeed associated with later life dementia hazard. Um, so this is helping us think about um, adjusting our window of susceptibility, maybe, maybe even earlier um, than we were originally thinking. We also sought to broaden our ideas about what compounds may be associated with dementia, not just looking at metals. So here's a project um, led by graduate students looking at data from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. Um, and here's looking at pesticides, um, specifically um, uh, breakdown products of the pesticides DDT. Um, and here we're looking at participants who are age 60 and above. Um, and we had blood levels of these compounds measured. And we looked at the exact same time period. So this is um, a cross-sectional study, only one time period. The previous studies were looking at longitudinal ones. So, so there's a few caveats when we just have uh, a single time point of data. Um, but this was looking at cognition and whether um, what type of, um, um, how strong your cognitive scores are on this metric called the digit symbol substitution test. And what we observed here um, for these two uh, DDT products, we observed participants had lower cognition below zero, so they had reductions in cognition for higher levels of pesticide exposure. Uh, we uh, were curious if that extended to multiple other compounds. So pesticides here in blue we were looking at, but we were also looking at these additional chemical families, uh, which included metals and green, um, included other persistent compounds such as polychlorinated biphenyls you might have heard from, a variety of other chemicals, including PFAS compounds. And here's that exact same plot. So we have their difference in cognition if you had twofold higher exposure. So values below zero, again, have lower cognition with exposure at this time point. And we looked across all kinds of chemicals. And we observed that um, here are these uh, DDT compounds up here. Um, but it's not just these DDT compounds. There's all kinds of chemicals that at this single time point are associated with lower levels of cognition. So this is broadening our lens and helping us look out um, at a wider spectrum of compounds that might be associated with dementia. Um, in addition, an important element to consider is that these chemical exposures are not randomly distributed in our population. There are important um, uh, historical racial biases um, and systemic racism that have influenced levels of exposure uh, in our population, as well as uh, behavioral differences among groups. Here, for example, is a study done by um, uh, Vinoen at the University of Michigan showing um, differences in exposure to certain chemicals on the x-axis um, by uh, race ethnicity in, among women in the US. So for example, here she observed that lead levels on average were higher among black women relative to white women. And lead we see is one of these compounds that's associated with lower cognition. Um, so this may be a pipeline or a process by which racial disparities and exposure um, may be uh, attributed to in part to racial disparities in dementia that we observe on population levels. We also see that there are importantly factors in the diet, factors in the environment, which are associated with improved cognition. Um, so we do have these good news stories. For example, here was a paper from the Rush Memory and Aging Project, um, which looked at participant levels of leafy green intake. Um, so here was looking at participants, I think age 80 and above, um, and based on a food frequency questionnaire, um, and then they followed them up over time, looked at their global cognitive score. They observed that participants who had the lowest level of intake of leafy greens had the steepest decline of cognition over that time period. And participants with the highest quintile or the highest 20 percentile of leafy green intake had the slowest cognitive decline. Um, so there's a little bit of this give and take in terms of the types of exposures we experience and the types of diet um, we ingest. And uh, so in terms of thinking about all of these factors, together as part of our total exposome.
Something else we noted that um, we often will see in a given population that there might be two individuals exposed to the exact same levels of an environmental chemical, uh, but they don't both develop dementia. So there's inner individual variability in um, disease risk, even after you're exposed to the same level. And one of the important ways that people are different is based on their genetics. So we're developing or we're working with methods to try to assess um, or quantify uh, genetic differences in um, terms of dementia risk as well. Um, so here it's looking at genetic differences at single positions called single nucleotide polymorphisms. We look at all of those um, genetic differences a person might have. Um, and we use a, a prior published study, which provides weights um, for how associated each one of those positions is with dementia. So we'll take your personal uh, cocktail of uh, genetic differences and we'll weight them by how strongly they're related to dementia. And we'll generate a cumulative or a polygenic risk score. Every person can get one value. And across a population, it looks like this, like a bell curve. Some people have high uh, cumulative risk for dementia genetically, and some people have low, and most people are right here in the middle. Uh, what we observed is when we look at across a population with normal cognition, we get this nice bell-shaped curve. Um, when we look at uh, participants with uh, cognitive impairment in the health and retirement study, we see this curve shifts a little bit to the right. And when we look at participants with dementia, we see this curve shifts further to the right. So clearly there's some association uh, between your cognitive status and your cumulative genetic load. Um, we calculated this in an adjusted model uh, um, and observed that yes, participants with higher cumulative genetic risk or polygenic score for dementia had higher odds of dementia. Um, we also observed that there were differences in the ability of these scores to predict across uh, genetic ancestry groups. European ancestry had a higher performance um, versus African ancestry group had a lower performance. And that likely reflects his historical differences in the participants who are represented in the genetic studies of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So who was represented in those studies, those weights that came from the prior published research likely um, are more representative or had more European ancestry participants included. So this is an important area we can, we can improve in our science going forward. So our goal and our hope is going forward um, with some newly funded support from the National Institute of Aging is to be able to look at both the environment and some of these cumulative genetic markers in the same study together. Um, so far, we've been looking at them as separate buckets and we, we all seek to bring them together. All right, so we've talked about several population-based studies. These are in human studies looking at associations. Um, so um, their relationships, not necessarily causal, um, but their really um, associations we might see over a longitudinal period or a cross-sectional time period. Those are important suggestions and they show us where to look. But the next step we need to do is to dial in to the mechanisms in the brain. And we need to see how is this happening? Is there a um, biologic plausibility for how this works? How, what can we learn about the process of dementia by understanding the uh, molecular features that these environmental chemicals cause? So this is the area we've been talking about so far in terms of in human studies, looking at people's exposure, um, looking at the levels in the bloodstream or the urine. Um, and there's evidence that many of these compounds can cross the blood brain barrier. Uh, but there's this whole space about how do we go from that exposure to Alzheimer's and dementia. So I'll show you a few pieces um, where we'll see that they, those compounds are able to reach the brain. And we'll talk specifically about how uh, a few of these compounds are um, shown through model organism studies to directly relate to Alzheimer's type pathology. So some of the characteristic Alzheimer's pathology include these beta amyloid plaques in the brain and these tau neurofibrillary tangles. So I'll show you some um, results looking at uh, uh, these pathologic markers in model studies with lead. Um, so this really extraordinary study led by Nasser Zawiya at the University of Rhode Island um, looked at the early life period in these macaque monkeys, these female monkeys um, that were exposed either to um, uh, a non-lead environment or a, a 
uh, drinking water containing 1.5 parts per million of lead during their early life, and they aged them up to age 23. So really extraordinary long-term exposure model. Um, and at age 23, they dissected the frontal cortex from these, uh, from these macaque monkeys. And they looked, they observed that the uh, monkeys that were exposed to lead in this, in this bar had elevated levels of the characteristic Alzheimer's pathology of the beta amyloid relative to those that um, were not exposed to lead. Um, they also observed that those exposed to lead had elevated levels of phosphorylated tau relative to controls. So this is showing in a, um, you know, a relevant primate model system, uh, which does develop some, some plaques and tangles normally over time, that there was an excess development of that that overlaps or characteristic with Alzheimer's pathology um, with exposure to lead in early life. Uh, this group also followed this up uh, with, a, um, with a study in rats. So similarly, they had um, rats exposed to control environment or a lead exposed environment in early life. They aged them up to 20 months. And here they were looking at both male and female offspring this time in the study. Um, and they observed, again, elevated beta amyloid deposition with lead treated relative to control. Um, they again observed elevated phosphorylated tau with lead exposure uh, relative to control. Um, and in addition, they started to look at some other uh, pathologies that might be related. So they observed that there were, um, with lead exposure here in um, black relative to gray, uh, in the control, they had reduced uh, number of synapses in the hippocampus, this key brain region for learning and memory. Um, and behaviorally, they noticed that the rats had poorer performance on the water maze. So they were uh, exhibiting behavioral deficits of learning and memory. Uh, this team also looked in mice. So they looked at uh, mice. So, so far we've seen monkey model, we've seen a rat model. Um, and here we'll see a mouse model using transgenic mice who were uh, designed to either have an impairment in the um, microtubule associated tau gene or the amyloid precursor protein gene. These are uh, mice that are predisposed to be risky for Alzheimer's-like pathology. Um, and they either treated them to a control environment or a lead exposed environment. They aged them up to 20 months, male and female offspring. Um, and they observed uh, that there was elevated um, levels of beta amyloid in the MAPT uh, transgenic model, particularly among mice that were exposed in early life um, and not in the mice that were exposed in later life. So there was some vulnerability, some window of susceptibility um, to being exposed to lead in that early life period. Um, they also observed that there were, um, in the APP transgenic mice, there were elevated levels of beta amyloid in the lead treated, the, the black bars here relative to the white bars. Um, they observed that the uh, lead treated mice had poor performance on the water maze. Um, and they observed uh, that the lead treated mice had poor performance on additional behavioral memory assays, these invisible platform assays and the visible platform assays. So we're seeing um, converging evidence from pathology studies and from behavioral studies um, and in three species of animals that there are deficits um, consistent with Alzheimer's type pathology in these model systems. Uh, with lead exposure. So this is providing some evidence of how could we potentially get from some of these exposures um, to one of these uh, disorders. There's also a lot of general um, uh, neurologic and brain related damage that can happen as a consequence of these metals exposure that's not necessarily specific to Alzheimer's disease pathology. So these were Alzheimer's specific and we'll see here a couple of examples of general neurotoxicity which can occur from some of these um, exposures. Uh, so specifically, I'll talk about some of my work looking at epigenetic changes as a consequence of lead exposure. Uh, so here uh, we were looking at uh, mice, which in their early life were exposed to either control environment or a low dose of lead or a higher dose of lead, aged them up to 10 months and looked at the offspring. And uh, we uh, dissected the frontal cortex tissue and used fluorescence assisted cell sorting um, to separate out just the neurons in that brain region. Um, and then we measured those neurons for DNA methylation, which is an epigenetic mark uh, that is involved in learning and memory in the brain um, and is a way that the um, 
lead related changes may persist over time. So this is a hypothesis about how could an exposure that's happening so early in life um, and then ends be relevant to something happening in later life. Uh, so here, what we observed on the y-axis is relative methylation level. On the x-axis is uh, genomic position. We observed like a dose response happening um, between these three different doses of lead. We are curious, so here we have specifically had a, asked ourselves a hypothesis about um, frontal cortex neurons. We were curious about whether this applies to other cell types in the brain, other brain regions. Um, and we were curious uh, specifically about other cell types because of this um, feature of fundamental biology. Um, so when we think about early on in development, what's happening as these animals are developing um, in, during this early life lead exposure, um, so we have stem cells in our body, which are going down this cascade of differentiation. So they're becoming either muscle cells, liver cells, neuron cells, intestinal cells. Um, and what we're measuring in our studies is um, uh, either a whole tube of blood or a whole ch chunk of tissue that has all of these different cell types um, combined in there. So there's a lot of heterogeneity in these samples we've been studying. Um, and as part of their fundamental biology, most of these cells are characterized. So here are three different um, uh, hypothetical cells in our, in our bloodstream. Um, part of their characteristic and what makes them a different cell type are these, uh, their levels of DNA methylation. So far, we've just been taking an average across all of those. We've been collapsing all that heterogeneity together. Um, but now there's exciting new technology out there that's making it possible for us to look at each of these cell types individually. And we are curious are, whether these metals exposure, whether this lead exposure um, is uh, changing um, methylation, DNA methylation levels within cells, or if it's changing other features. So here, for example, we might be looking at that here's this cell type, here's this cell type, and here's this cell type. And on average, here's how much methylation we have. If we have a lead exposure scenario that is giving us an average increase in methylation uh, with the exposure, we're not totally sure if it's having a direct effect, if it's that exposure is increasing um, these methylation changes across all cells. If there's a particularly vulnerable cell that's highly responsive, here we hypothesize neurons might be highly responsive. Um, or if there's no change in methylation in any cell, but we're getting a shift in our cell proportion. So maybe there's an inflammatory state that's happening in the brain um, that we're just capturing it with this methylation. Um, so here we worked with uh, uh, a mouse study of early life lead exposure, either no lead exposure or a higher lead exposure. Um, the mice were aged up to five months. Um, and we dissected the hippocampus, so this key um, Alzheimer's pathology brain region. And we dissociated now all of the tissue, all of the cells in that tissue, not just the neurons. So we were casting a wider net. We were curious about um, more cells in this region. We use a new technology called single cell RNA sequencing, which allowed us to um, uh, work with a microfluidics device, which separated each cell into an oil droplet, provided unique barcodes um, so that the RNA um, Gene expression could be uniquely mapped back to that original cell. Um, so the original cell, the individual cells are fed into this device, um, and we're able to um, sequence all of these uh, the gene expression products together, and then later um, deconvolute or separate out which cell type they came from. So here's a little bit of what the data look like. Um, so our cells from each sample are in the columns. Here's our genes in the rows. Um, and we're able to obtain you know, up to 5,000 cells per sample. One that might be uh, exposed to lead, another 5,000 cells that might be exposed to control, and it goes on and on. So this is a little bit of our data structure. Now, instead of getting a single average per animal, we're getting individual measurements within cells. Uh, so here's a view of what the hippocampus looks like in these, in these mice. Um, you can think of this like a principal components plot where the um, uh, axes are describing um, differences among cells. And just like in my cartoon, each dot on this plot is a cell. Um, and the cells which are closer together on here have more shared features or are more similar, have more similar uh, gene expression. We were able to identify 12 different um, cell type clusters. So these data are painted by the different um, cell types. We compared this data to um, 
publicly available data on, on brain cell types. Um, so we identified, okay, this cluster, um, one is likely microglia based on its expression of the, this and other marker genes. Okay, this cluster is likely oligodendrocytes. This cluster is likely endothelial cells on and on identifying neurons. Um, and eventually we're able to identify or predict which of these cell types are which. Now here comes the fun part. This is that exact same plot, but it's been painted by uh, the treatment status of the mouse. So in red are the mice which were from control animals, and in blue are the cells which came from a lead treated animal. And the first thing I kind of noticed here when I zoom out is that they're not randomly distributed across the plot, right? There tends to be kind of clusters. Um, where there are more of one color present. And when we quantify that, um, we observe that there indeed are different cell types where there's different proportions by lead exposure. So for example, lead exposure has a relatively higher abundance of oligodendrocytes relative to controls, as well as a relatively higher a percentage of oligodendrocyte precursors. And oligodendrocytes are these support cells in the brain that wrap around the um, uh, axon, of neurons and allow uh, neuronal signaling to happen at a faster rate. Um, so this is a, a way of um, enhancing or enabling increased or ra more rapid signaling in the brain. Um, so this was uh, teaching us that glial cells are likely highly vulnerable to lead. And my uh, earlier hypothesis of focusing exclusively on neurons was a little bit short-sighted. And it's helpful to use some of these uh, newer strategies to look at a more wide variety of cells in the tissues in terms of where the effects of these chemical exposures might be embodied. Um, we're, we're always... Uh, skeptical of findings in just one system, and we wanted to replicate this in another system. So we looked at a cell culture model of neural progenitor cells um, that were treated with lead. And we observed um, that there were increased levels of oligodendrocyte precursor cells with higher lead levels over time, um, as well as increased levels of oligodendrocyte marker genes. So in our original study in mice, as well as in this human cell culture model, we see converging evidence um, that, that this is a, a, an effect of, of lead exposure. With this uh, strategy, we're also able to look for differences in gene expression or RNA levels um, with lead exposure. Uh, we observed uh, overall several genes which had different expression levels in the hippocampus with uh, prenatal lead exposure, and that the locations of these uh, genes which are different had different expression levels with lead exposure were enriched or overlapped with um, locations which were highlighted from Alzheimer's disease genome-wide association studies in humans. So the lead response pathways have significant overlap with the Alzheimer's disease pathways. So there's something coming up here where lead in early life is changing the same genes uh, which folks studying humans are noting are changed genetically in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we also noted that there were differences in gene expression, um, which varied by cell clusters. So for example, microglia had altered protein folding um, RNA expression. Oligodendrocytes had uh, altered uh, regulation of immune genes. Um, and we observed some double strand break repair um, differences in parasites. So we're able to look within specific cell types to see how are each cell type responding. So by way of conclusion and kind of wrapping up, we've seen, we've been on a little bit of a journey. We've seen in human studies, um, when participants are exposed to environmental chemicals, we've seen things as far as air pollution, uh, we've seen lead, we've seen cadmium, we've seen pesticides. Um, when humans are exposed to these environmental chemicals, um, they can be absorbed into the bloodstream. We as researchers can monitor or measure someone's exposure level in blood or in urine or other tissues. Um, and we can test for an association uh, between those biomarker levels of the exposure um, and a person's likelihood of developing dementia or Alzheimer's disease over time. Um, so these are the types of studies we can often do in humans. And then we can link up with folks um, studying in the laboratory in toxicology studies to say, hey, do, do, does treatment or exposure to these same compounds um, result in pathologic changes in model systems that overlap with these disorders um, and or do any of the um, pathology 
overlap with general neurotoxicity. So maybe not specific to Alzheimer's disease, but is there general brain-related damage coming on here? Um, the next level of these type of studies, which I didn't show you here, but is also um, this opportunity for intervention. Um, so here in, in green, I highlight all these places by which we may be able to, um, once this process has gotten started, um, intervene or modify this, this um, process. So upstream, we can have um, policies or interventions at the point of exposure. Um, we can try to rectify these um, historic disparities which exist in our heart societies. Um, we can also, we saw examples where nutrition or supplementation or in that um, study that came out this week and uh, uh, different pharmaceutical um, factors can influence um, your body's response to exposures. Um, we also see that there may be opportunities to intervene on some of these pathways uh, once this has happened in the body. Um, and to zoom out a little bit further to recap, we've seen that there are several environmental exposures which may be relevant to dementia. And it's a powerful tool when we try to integrate both the human population-based epidemiology as well as the cell and molecular toxicology. So when we see those two elements coming together with convergent findings, we start to have more support for these ideas. We've also seen that timing is important. Um, so there are some windows of susceptibility that may be different for different chemicals in terms of when our brain is most likely um, to be vulnerable to compounds. Um, and we saw that linking some of these uh, DNA methylations, some of these RNA biomarkers, some of these pathologic markers um, can be helpful tools to help us characterize steps along this pathway and put, put these pieces together. Um, and then lastly, I want to mention it's, it's useful to think about the tissue, to think about the cell type specific effects, and to help ourselves zoom out and think about um, various other um, cells which might be vulnerable to this process. So I want to thank you so much for your attention today. I want to acknowledge this fantastic team of trainees and staff that make this research possible, as well as several collaborators um, and outstanding funding that, that we've received from the National Institutes of Health and other, other places. All right. Thank you. So we have a few questions that we're going to get to in just a second. Um, so quickly, this is our next upcoming event. So you can save the date for that, June 22nd. Our next presentation will be What's Your Style? How Your Caregiving Style Impacts the Care You Provide in Your Own Well-Being. And um, you can register. There's a link to register. And then you can also find out how to register from our um, website, or you can join our e-newsletter to stay tuned as well. Next slide, please. All right, and so if you, again, want to stay in the loop with what's going on, then please join our monthly e-newsletter. And now let's get into the questions. And I'm also going to place the link for the evaluation in the Q&A box as well as the chat box. So our first question for you is, what type of fish has the most, um, I believe, cad cadmium so we can avoid it? I don't know if this is cadmium, if that's not a thing. OK. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, thank you for this question. Yeah. This is um, one of these types of research where folks are most often, um, it's very powerful to make this connection to your own lives and to your own experiences and to what is present in your environment. We learned that um, many environmental compounds bioaccumulate up the food chain. So that means as, uh, as the um, as organisms eat smaller organisms, we, the uh, higher order um, organism has higher levels or higher concentrations of many of these compounds. Um, and that includes potentially metals uh, such as mercury and potentially cadmium, as well as other um, environmental hazards um, such as polychlorinated biphenols. So um, in general, uh, higher up the food, food chain, animals tend to have higher deposition rates of these compounds, which bioaccumulate or uh, accumulate higher in, in those, those areas. So in general, um, without picking out and being able to pick out any specific uh, fish species right now, um, when, we, when we eat smaller, um, smaller fish that are lower and the, and the cycle, the food cycle, there are potentially lower levels of many of these compounds in them. Mm 
Okay. Do tools currently exist to flush some of these metals and chemicals out of our system? Yes, there are um, tools to flush some metals out of the system. Um, clinically, this process is known as chelation, um, and this would be done specifically under the care and prescription of a doctor, and it is only advised in uh, situations of really high levels of acute metal poisoning. Um, in general, uh, if we're all exposed to low levels of metals in our lives, our body is relatively efficient at either um, removing those metals that are not needed from our body or sequestering them in, in tissues where they're kind of out of the way. Like how I mentioned, um, lead can be sequestered in our bones. In general, it would be advised to leave that lead right in your bones and not try to chelate it or pull it back out so that now it's bioactive and in your bloodstream. So um, in general, this is a chelation is something that would be done um, under an extreme acute toxicity and it would be done under the strict advice and um, prescription of a doctor. Um, in, in a broader population sense, um, I'm not a clinician, but in general, we would, we would recommend a well-balanced diet that um, includes uh, leafy greens, that includes um, uh, essential metals such as iron and copper, which can help uh, compete in your body so that you don't absorb as much of these toxic metals that you might be around. Um, and some uh, uh, more general health and well-being strategies um, in terms of uh, addressing uh, exposure levels. Thank you. Okay. And so how in the studies that you cite, how do authors determine that the metal is the cause of the dementia rather than one of the many environmental or economic education or other parameters um, that are only correlated with metal exposure? Yeah, this is a wonderful question and, and uh, a very deep question that we struggle with methodologically in the field in terms of thinking about is um, metals, are metals causally related with dementia or are they um, just a marker of some in general adverse uh, characteristics, adverse experiences or adverse environments that might be uh, traveling or correlated, as you say, with, with that metals exposure. Um, and so we try to approach this through many ways. And one of those is um, uh, something we call triangulation. So we're trying to test um, different study designs to see if metals are associated with dementia. So we might test in those human longitudinal follow-up studies. We also might test in the laboratory setting with these animals or with uh, uh, cell culture experiments because each of these um, tests has different assumptions. And if we start to see converging evidence across uh, different study designs, then we're more confident that it might be um, causal. But of course, it is essential that we be cautious and not overinterpret our findings um, that our association in, na in nature um, with, the, with some of these human observational studies. Um, we have some really amazing collaborations ongoing right now where folks who are um, outstanding social epidemiologists really experienced at measuring adverse social environments and exposures there um, through the Institute for Social Research. Um, and we're trying to tease apart um, chemical and non-chemical stressors that do often co-occur um, in terms of what might be a causal agent or is there an additive experience, um, adverse experience that happens from the convergence or co-localization of both of these factors coming together. So that I think we'll start to see um, more and better studies going forward that are investigating both social factors as well as chemical factors jointly in the same way to try to tease apart some of these features. But in general, to try to understand causality, um, we have many approaches, including um, testing uh, in, in laboratory settings as well to try to support or test or um, um, observe consistency if, if possible um, amongst our human observational studies as well as our complementary uh, model systems. Thank you. And a couple more. Um, when the rats and mice are exposed to PB, did they see any sex specific effects in beta amyloid formation? Yeah, this is a really interesting question. There's been some fantastic studies looking at sex specific effects in dementia. And um, in general, uh, we observe in humans that females are more likely to um, develop dementia. And that uh, is, is true at what, from the studies I've seen, that's true even after you adjust for um, increased longevity of women in our society. Um, so 
in terms of thinking of how did this connect to the lead um, animal studies, in that initial monkey study, that one was conducted exclusively in female macaques. So for that one, we can't comment on the male-female differences because that was only studied in female monkeys. In the uh, rat and my studies that I saw that I cited in there um, were done both in males and females, and I don't recall seeing them split out by sex. So I think that this is um, something that's becoming more uh, of an interest in being able to do a stratified analysis where you look to see if it's consistent across sexes. I think that's a really um, interesting and exciting avenue to pursue to see if there's any increased vulnerability in a certain group or um, susceptibility there. In terms of um, outside of the Alzheimer's pathology um, and looking at the DNA methylation and the RNA expression, there we have seen important differences in both the males and the females exposed to um, lead where we see uh, different genes have uh, altered DNA methylation or gene expression um, with lead exposure in both male and female frontal cortex. Um, but uh, so there, there may be different pathways that are acting um, in these two groups to um, ha have uh, adverse consequences. Okay, thank you. And then we have time for our last question. Does exposure to earlier tef Teflon pan cooking increase dementia? Oh yeah, this is neat too. So Teflon is um, a product um, that includes uh, PFOS, so perfluorinated alkyl substances, um, which are present in many compounds, uh, many consumer products such as our Gore-Tex Gore rain jackets. They're really useful. They're, they're um, highly water repellent. They're also what make our Teflon pans non-stick. And they're, um, as we use this product, uh, some of that Teflon, some of those perfluorinated alcohol substances come off of the pan and are deposited in the food that we eat. Um, so we do get some exposure to perfluoroalkanated substances through the repeated or continued use of Teflon pans in our cooking. So uh, there have been studies where they show that people who use regularly use those pans have higher levels of perfluoroalkanated substances be able to be detected in their bloodstream. Um, I have not yet seen a study of perfluoral substances and longitudinal um, or incident dementia risk. Um, in our cross-sectional study where we looked at a single time point, um, we didn't observe an association be between PFAS and um, dementia, but we really need some of these like long-term studies that are able to assess uh, potentially the relevant window of susceptibility. So I think this is a, a really exciting area to move into. All right. Well, thank you. Well, that actually um, concludes the Q&A. We don't have any more and we're running out of time. So thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Again, you will receive an email with the link for the evaluation. And I've also placed that link in the chat box. So um, thanks again, Dr. Bukulski. Take care, everyone. Have a great day and stay safe.